Good morning. This is Nicholas Martin with the American Carbon Registry. And uh, welcome to our brand new methodology, quantification methodology for reduced carbon intensity of fed cattle. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining the webinar today uh, to learn about this very interesting and innovative new methodology. Just a second while I get control of the slides. So I'm going to start by um, just just uh, really spending a, a very short time to give some general background, first logistics of the webinar, a little bit of uh, background on um, on ACR and our you know the, the the reason this this particular methodology type is a priority for us. Then we're going to hand off to Gareth Boyd with the Persino Group to talk about uh, how this methodology evolved, the Conservation Innovation Grant under which it is evolving, and uh, the team that has put it together. And then the bulk of the webinar today will be Karen hogan Kozira, also with the Persino Group, um, just, just trying to give you the basics of the methodology, how it works, what it applies to. And, and we'll save a, a nice chunk of time at the end, um, about 45 minutes if we need it, for question and answer. First, just on the logistics, um, there's a couple different ways to ask questions. Um, in your webinar pane, you should see near the bottom a chat box, and you can type your question right into there, and uh, it will come through to me, and at the end of the, the presentations, I'll start asking questions to the appropriate person. Um, the other option, if you prefer to ask your question verbally, um, you should see on, on the, in the upper left corner of your webinar pane a little hand, and you can click that to raise your hand. That'll hold your place in line to ask your question yourself, and then I'll, uh, during the Q&A period, I'll unmute you to, to ask your question. I also wanted to, to highlight for everyone that this methodology is currently open for public comment through September 20th. So um, the, part of the purpose of this web, webinar is just educational, but partly it's also to, to get um, feedback from folks um, on the webinar, sorry, on, on the methodology. And we will be, um, any questions and answers that get asked in this uh, webinar, we will include in the public comment um, documentation. And if you are, you know, on the webinar and, and, and got, get interested in the methodology or want to ask more questions than this format allows, please, by all means, um, go to the ACR website and, and um, you'll find this methodology, the public comment draft. You can submit your comments to us and all the, all the public comments, whether submitted in writing or through the webinar, will be responded to by the authors. And then finally, I wanted to mention that today's webinar will be recorded. Uh, and both both the audio recording and the and the PowerPoint presentation uh, will be made available to all the all the registrants. So, just a couple slides of background. Uh, first of all, on the Winrock International Institute for Agricultural Development, which is the parent nonprofit of which the American Carbon Registry is part, um, you can see at the top of the slide uh, Winrock's general mission statement. Uh, Winrock really works all around the world. I think in about 60 countries now. Um, with around a thousand staff, uh, and and really our mission overall is to empower the disadvantaged, increase economic opportunity, and sustain natural resources. So Winrock is a larger organization, but but I wanted to highlight that that um, interestingly for this methodology, Winrock really grew out of um, the Rockefeller tra uh, tradition. Uh, Winrock stands for Winthrop Rockefeller, who you see on the slide there. Winthrop was sort of the black sheep of the Rockefeller. The, the five brothers uh, who left um, uh, East Coast banking and oil uh, and the oil business went out to Arkansas, bought a lot of land, and started raising cattle. And so, really, from the very start of Winrock's history, we've been um, involved with uh, issues of agriculture and uh, livestock. Um, there were three predecessor uh, Rockefeller family organizations uh, that merged in 1985 to become a Winrock International. And so really going back to the very beginning, the, the mission of Winrock has, has been related to agricultural research and extension, 
looking at ways to help farmers improve yield, uh, looking at uh, technologies and practices for global food security. Um, and, and really specifically trying to do that through connecting farmers with new markets. So um, the work that ACR is doing these days in, in this and other agricultural methodologies really flows from that same tradition. How, ca how can we promote innovation in agriculture? How can we uh, promote environmental improvement and use markets, in this case markets for greenhouse gas credits, as a mechanism to uh, to improve profitability and um, and uh, create incentives for farmers and livestock ranchers to do new things. Um, the American Carbon Registry was the first uh, voluntary carbon registry in the United States, founded in 1996. Uh, we've we've issued about 38, 39 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent in uh, verified carbon reductions since that time in a broad variety of different different project types. Um, in brief, the, the roles of, of the American Carbon Registry, like other registries that are out there, we develop and approve carbon protocols. You're going to hear about one today. We, we, we both approve, so we, we develop some protocols in-house and others, like the one that you're about to hear about, are, are written by, other, by, by external authors but are um, put through a, a methodology uh, review, uh, public review, and uh, scientific peer review process. Um, secondly, we re we uh, projects come to us, carbon credit projects using those methodologies come to ACR. They're reviewed and and registered uh, on on our uh, carbon registry. Uh, they are then um, in the independently validated and verified. But do the verification, of course. That that's done by um, uh, specialized uh, and, and accredited uh, auditors. And then finally, uh, the registry plays the function of transparently tracking and, and uh, retirements and transactions in those credits when they're sold or when they're retired to, to meet a, uh, a, a carbon reduction or carbon neutrality commitment of a variety of different kinds of buyers, both, both voluntary and uh, regulated. Um, ACR was approved by the California Air Resources Board late last year as an offset project registry and early action offset program for the California cap and trade market, um, meaning that we uh, uh, play a similar role in California now to the role we've been playing as a voluntary registry uh, since 1996, where projects that are developed under um, the, the offset protocols approved by the California Air Resources Board as well as the early action offset protocols that ARB has recognized, come to ACR, are reviewed, uh, you know, list list with ACR, go through a verification process, and are ultimately issued registry offset credits that can be converted into ARB offset credits and used by regulated entities in the California cap and trade market. Uh, in terms of prices, um, according to the ecosystem marketplace, across um, all ACR transactions in 2012, the average price was $7.40 a ton, up a bit from, from the previous year. Um, I should mention this, this is just for voluntary purchases. This doesn't include um, California credits that are, that are transacting um, at somewhat higher prices. So the last thing I want to do before hadding, handing off to Garth is talk a little bit about greenhouse gas emissions in U.S. agriculture and, and why that picture has directed um, our attention toward putting a priority on, on new methodologies for agricultural greenhouse gas uh, mitigation. So in this first slide, I'm going to do this sort of from the, from the biggest level down and, and then adding a little bit of detail. Um, in the first slide, you see U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in 2011 and the slice of that that represents uh, agriculture. Um, you can all, all these next three slides come from the US EPA greenhouse gas inventory, um, which has data from 1990 through 2011. So if you look at the change since 1990, agricultural emissions have, have gone up a bit. Um, on the other hand, there's been large increases in agricultural productivity since that time. So, so on, a, on a per unit of product or sort of an intensity basis, uh, emissions have decreased. Now, uh, splitting up within that slice of the pie that was 
agriculture. What does that look like? Well, you can see here that um, more than half of that pie, um, 247 million metric tons, comes from agricultural soil management. That's basically nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizer uh, application. That's the biggest piece. That's why ACR has, in fact, these days two different methodologies to try to incentivize uh, reducing the greenhouse ga gases from fertilizer. The next biggest piece, though, is, is uh, methane from enteric fermentation in livestock. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more what types of livestock in the following slides. So, so 137 million metric tons a year is enteric fermentation. After that, the next slice is manure, and that's methane and nitrous oxide from livestock manure. So you can see that you know, once you've addressed nitrous oxide from fertilizer on the right side of the pie, really uh, uh, the, most of the rest of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions is from livestock, enteric and manure. And I guess you could add that, that a, a, you know, an appreciable chunk of the, 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 the blue, the ag soil management, uh, is fertilizer used to produce feed, grain feed for, for livestock. So, so indirectly, that's, that's attributable to, to livestock as well. Now, these are inevitably going to be large emissions, but we think there are uh, ways to unlock the potential opportunities for reductions in this sector, uh, and in particular through new methodologies. And, and, and you're going to hear about one of them in, in just a second. Um, again, um, in all of these categories, uh, emissions have increased. Uh, since uh, 1990. Finally, now breaking up the livestock sector emissions in this third pie, um, you can see that uh, about almost 100 million metric tons in 2011 were enteric emissions from beef cattle. Uh, and uh, then the, um, the, the next slice, the 33 million metric tons, were enteric emissions from dairy cattle, and then a very small amount enteric from other animals. But really, that's, that's quite, quite small. So beef and dairy cattle are the majority of it. That takes us to about two-thirds of the pie. The remainder from the purple slice, 32.4 tons, all the rest is related to manure. And so dairy, uh, whereas beef represent the, the, the largest enteric emissions, dairy represent the largest manure primarily because of the beef and dairy manure management is quite different. Um, the next slice is beef manure, and then swine, and then poultry, and then everything else, you know, horses, goats, sheep, other livestock. So um, one of the things I want to just sort of communicate from this, this slide is that um, this methodology uh, for quantification uh, of, of reduced carbon intensity in fed cattle is, is addressing the biggest piece here. It's, it's, it's for uh, cattle feed yards. It's looking at um, enteric and manure emissions from beef cattle. And again, looking at the percent change since 1990, you, you'll see that beef uh, enteric and manure greenhouse gases have gone up a bit. But in fact, beef production has gone up more. So um, that's interesting. That is an indicator that on an intensity basis or per unit of output basis, uh, greenhouse gas emissions have, have been on the decline. And, um, and what this methodology is really looking to do is, is unlock more opportunities uh, for, for um, producers raising beef to reduce on an intensity basis the, uh, their, their emissions per pound of carcass weight that's produced. Um, and, and we think there's there's significant opportunity to 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 move further in that direction. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. This is just sort of very high level background to the methodology. I'm going to turn over now to Garth Boyd to talk about the um, the how this methodology came about, and then he'll turn things over to Karen to talk about the methodology itself. Garth, thank you, Nick. I appreciate that introduction. Hello, everyone. The uh, this protocol really has some interesting roots. Uh, many years ago, uh, Matt Sutton Vermullen and myself were brainstorming on ways to create carbon credits from the reduced enteric emissions of methane from cattle. And uh, we actually worked with the Lanco Animal Health a bit uh, to do that because of the Monensum product. 
Um, we kept uh, brainstorming for a few years, and in the meantime, Matt uh, organized what was the, or, or still is, the, the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, and that conference took place in November of 2010. Karen uh, attended that conference, and I met Karen for the first time, and we were talking about uh, our early efforts to um, to try and create carbon credits uh, for beef cattle because of uh, reducing enteric emissions of methane. And she communicated to me that, well, it just happened that she was one of the co-authors of a protocol for the Alberta offset system that did just that. And that was news to me. I was aware that maybe six or seven years ago, under the clean development mechanism of the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that uh, a, uh, a gentleman named Bowman had submitted a protocol for approval to reduce the emissions of methane from dairy cattle and, I think, Kenya, and that that protocol is not accepted. So um, the Alberta protocol was the only one that I had ever heard of globally that uh, tried to quantify and, and credit uh, that reduced enteric emissions of methane. So it was like a light bulb went off and I said, we have got to uh, work together somehow. And about the same time, uh, NRCS announced uh, a special round of funding, I believe it was $25 million, for um, uh, greenhouse gas centric um, conservation innovation grants. And so we decided to, Karen and I, to throw in and uh, apply for a grant. And while working on that, it became more and more obvious that we needed the help of Matt to connect with uh, you know, various of the dots. And so uh, we began working together on that. We submitted the proposal. And lo and behold, uh, won a grant from NRCS, which has facilitated the work that we're going to com communicate to you. The, the focus of the proposal and of our, our work uh, for three years is to basically adapt three of the protocols in the Alberta offset system to U.S.-centric conditions and uh, the latest science in this arena. And, uh, and create a, a, a protocol that will hopefully be approved by ACR and then we can, uh, we will be working with U.S. feed yards to, to uh, pilot test this. And even beyond that, the, uh, so, so this protocol really also birthed uh, the Persino group just personally. Um, it's been a great thing because four of us have come together, two in Canada and two in the U.S. to start this, this company called the Persino Group, and we're a little over two years old now, but this protocol is sort of the, the genesis of that. Okay, I don't seem to have control of the slides. If we could advance that. Here we go. Karen, do you want to speak to the uh, history of the Alberta offset system? I will. Thanks. I was just struggling to get them off of mute. Um, yeah, so Alberta has, since mid-2007, had a regulatory framework for uh, about 100 facilities to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by about 12% every year. Um, they have a number of ways they can comply to that target reduction. One of them is through the use of offsets. So it is a regulatory or compliance-based offset that we're talking about with all of the rigor that goes behind a compliance-based offset, uh, third-party verification, reasonable level of assurance. And so we, in our five-and-a-half-year compliance cycle that just finished, or compliance years that finished the end of 2012. And uh, so when I put some of the stats here at the bottom, um, in terms of what we have at the registry, so this is the registry for the verified uh, emissions offsets within the Alberta uh, compliance-based system. 
we have 142 projects that are registered, over 28.5 million tons of CO2e verified reductions that have been registered, and about 19.6 million tons of those have been used for compliance and retired from the system. 34 quantification protocols overall in that time period, um, much like ACR uh, runs their process in that uh, proponents can bring forward protocols, develop them, submit them to a review process, um, but it is about four levels of review, going from very technical to finally a public posting, an internal government review, and that's operated cooperatively with the government of Alberta and C3, which hosts this registry and is the window, if you will, to the offset system. We use the ISO 14064.2 process-based standard to develop our protocols, and they're heavily, at least the agricultural ones, are heavily based on the IPCC quantification methodologies informed by our National Emissions Inventory reporting, adaptation of those methodologies, and uh, science that's based on Canadian conditions. In the Alberta offset system, um, we have uh, eight agricultural protocols, and this particular protocol is being tested through pilot studies, and we have one uh, beef carbon project, the first of its kind in the world, registered on the registry. Go ahead, Garth. Okay. Trying to advance the slide here. All right. So. The first thing that we uh, did to kick off this project was assemble a team, and I'm sure uh, some of you are on this call, of the what we call the Protocol Scientific Adaptation Team. Some of the top uh, greenhouse gas uh, scientists and animal scientists in uh, the United States and Canada to come together and review the Alberta protocols uh, line by line formula by formula, and discuss the relevance of them to the uh, United States beef cattle feeding sector, as well as any recent advancements in the science. And this group came together uh, with Ermias Kabriab at UC Davis uh, hosting us there on campus for this uh, two-day meeting. It was intense, it was highly productive, and it was the uh, foundation for our work in adapting these protocols. Uh, uh, and, and a lot of work was accomplished then, and a lot of work since to basically bring us to the point where we submitted the protocol to ACR, and of course they have posted that now for public comment. Any other comments on that, Karen? You can see the names of the people, and of course their picture uh, to the right there. Yep, I, I think I'd only add, Garth, that um, the process we used to gain consensus, it's very difficult to gain consensus um, in the scientific community, but um, there was just, our definition of consensus was sort of no, no outstanding objection. And so we strove to make sure that the adaptations of the science and the Alberta protocols, this one particular is the result of three being amalgamated into one, sat well with every single one of these individuals. And as you can tell the, um, the, the, from the previous slide, the acronym BIGS, uh, which is the name of this project uh, that led to this protocol is Bovine Innovative Greenhouse Gas Solutions. Karen, I'll let you talk to this one, please. You, which you basically have. Yep. Thank you. Um, as we went through the process of reviewing the, the way the IPCC equations were embedded in the protocol for the key calculations to estimate GHG emissions and emissions reductions from baseline and project, the science team identified a number of improvements that could be made. So the way IPCC calculates the amount of nitrogen that's retained or, if you will, excreted by dairy and beef cattle, nobody was happy with. And so um, based on NRC, we developed and ratified basically by our, uh, our internal peer review process with these individuals a, a better set of equations that I hope will start to make their way into other uh, uh, 
entities or processes or, or methodologies, protocols, whatever you call it, that you use uh, that are estimating GHG emissions. Also on the use of ionophores, a lot of outstanding questions in both the dairy and the cattle sector about the impact of ionophores on GHG emissions and um, in, in the document, in the protocol, these are outlaid in terms of where these are published and then how they were adopted into the protocol for use on emissions reductions. Um, fat content of diets, we needed to understand, and Karen Boschman led this one on, what is the literature saying with respect to the variations in fat content or animal classes or the way fats are incorporated into diets and what effect that has on the enteric methane emissions factor or the YM value used in um, the IPCC equations and the relationship between forage quality and the effect on that emissions factor. Um, in previous uh, iterations of protocols, there were a variety of indicators of forage quality and based on the work that Dr. Amias Kibriov and his graduate students have done, which is now published, there's a much more um, simplified relationship, if you will, and easier for feed yards to measure in the ration data that they send off for analysis that will give us the indication we need on the effect of YM. I don't appear to have control here. One last thing to add as I take over from Garth um, is that we, you'll notice in the team, if you saw the picture, that we have had uh, representatives of the industry as well following along with us, uh, Texas Cattle Feeders and Innovative Livestock Solutions and others to help make sure that what we're doing can be grounded um, in reality um, and that the feed yard operators have the capacity to be able to, uh, to, to undertake these protocols. It's a big, huge, huge concern of ours is that to make sure there's something out there that's, that's real and can be used. So with that, I'm going to go into the next part of the presentation and cover off, walk you through some of the major headings of the protocol and how it addresses them. I know my mouse is moving, but I can't advance the slide. So Paul, if you would. It's kind of odd. Oh, okay. So the scope of the protocol, as Nick Martin had mentioned in the opening statements, is um, confined to the beef cattle feed yard. It is not for the cow-calf operator or the backgrounder. Uh, it's strictly to be implemented at the feed yard level. You could hit that again for me, Paul. It's obviously only applicable in the U.S. Um, some of the ACR protocols have applicability outside of the U.S., but this one is relegated to the U.S. based on the science and the implementation variables. And a really key point in, in this protocol is to realize that um, it, it's the range of, there are a number of range of practices that are considered within the scope of this protocol. Paul, if you could hit it again, please. Um, and we lay examples of feeding practices. It, the ability for feed yards to innovate, and they do. Um, if you've seen the production statistics, as Nick pointed out, and where we're at in terms of the concomitant increase in greenhouse gases, there's been a decoupling of that trend in productivity and, and greenhouse gases. And so we did not want to tie a feed yard to any one strategy. Um, it's not a technology-based protocol where there is a installation there are going to be, and it does occur in real practice, the ability for or feed yard operators to alter their feeding management and technologies as they go forward and innovate and see that they are uh, actually happening. And so, Paul, if you'd hit the, the button again, please. It does not prescribe any one practice. The metrics are based on the kilograms of CO2e per kilogram of carcass weight produced in the project. And that metric, the outcome of the innovative suite of practices, is really the key to this, this protocol. Now, the types of practices that we're talking about are listed in the Section 2.1. And we're seeing that there is the, our technologies evolving that 
can allow feed yard operators to track individual animal performance and cattle sorting. In, in practice, feed yard operators will look at certain characteristics of the animals, gender, um, uh, whether, where they appear on the grid, carcass frame, um, you know, whether they're being bought in as a calf-fed animal or a yearling-fed animal, and they will group those animals according to expected performance and feed them accordingly. Now there's technologies coming and they're available for them to be able to look at more, a more granular way of getting the most performance they can out of you know, a smaller group of animals, sometimes even individuals. So that's the future, I think, of, of some of the feed yard uh, future. There are a number of feeding strategies that can be used that have been demonstrated to be used to uh, suppress enteric uh, methane emissions from cattle. Uh, these are feed additives like fats and oils, other types of, uh, you know, final electron acceptors. Uh, there are various feeding technologies that are out in the marketplace, beta agonists which promote lean muscle growth and uh, the growth promoters, uh, use of ionophores as we mentioned and with the meta-analysis that's been done, we understand the impact now of sort of the newly prescribed dosage increases of, of ionophores for use in, in cattle. Uh, and genetic improvements, there are both genetic markers and tests for those genetic markers that are emerging as well as phenotypic uh, methods of selecting for phenotypic traits that, you know, one animal will convert the same amount of feed much more efficiently, and this is a huge potential for improvements in, in uh, you know, raising cattle and getting and the most out of them as you can. And then there's going to be a, a suite of other ones. This protocol crediting period suggested to be 10 years. Within that time frame, what, what else will evolve? And so that gives you the scope of how we framed um, the, the protocol. Moving into the applicability requirements now, um, what we have for applicability requirements is listed in the, uh, in the first section, I think 2.2, is that obviously to, in order to implement, uh, the project oper developer will need to have sufficient data and documentation that details the content and quality of feed per animal grouping as well as the performance data um, um, and animal number data, inventory data. The grouping criteria must be similar between baseline and project calculations in order to meet the veracity requirements of this protocol. We're going to be talking a lot about that in the next few slides. This, this protocol does not uh, enable manure management strategies. It quantifies the reductions in manure-based emissions from the feeding end of things. So, you know, have there been feeding strategies put in that, that uh, decrease the amount of volatile solids excreted or, or nitrogen excreted by the animal? The requirement of a manure management plan, you know, most states have those as a requirement, is just to be able to say, have they been managing their manure the same way since baseline? Or have they done a major change that needs to be considered? So have they installed a digester or are they composting? So it's sort of the evidentiary requirement to say, yep, they've got a manure management plan in place, they're complying with regulations at the state level, and they're managing it the same way they've been managing throughout the, the time period of the project. And the applicability create go on to list a number of other things, um, as well as there's a flexibility section in there. Um, that I'm not going to go into at this point in time, but, but a lot of the things in the flexibility section flag uh, the user and the verifier of things they need to pay attention to. Next slide, please, Paul. The key, the, one of the key things here is the animal groupings. As I mentioned before, to get the most performance out of the animal, the feed yard operators will group them in terms of the uh, gender of the animal, whether or not they're coming in on a certain production system, a backgrounding system, for example, which is an older animal coming in, yearling fed, winter fed. These are examples that I've put here at a very high level, but you may see some feed yards that are starting to, you know, categorize animals into even finer uh, refinements. 
the performance standard baseline that we've set really does dictate how you would group animals. We'll get into that in a moment, but in order to be able to calculate like versus like to get a true emission reduction, you need to be able to calculate an estimate on a grouping basis. Next slide, please, Paul. So we're going to go into the performance standard baseline. We're very pleased with the ability of this protocol. It's a significant innovation from the original Alberta-based protocol. Next slide, please, Paul. And if you would just hit the, um, the bullets, that's fine. Um, the performance standard baseline works in setting for each, by gender, and each animal weight class, um, the kilograms of CO2e per kilogram of carcass weight in the baseline. It's a historic standard baseline. So if we were to look at the way the baseline is outlined in Section 3.4 of the protocol, um, it basically lays out a number of years, and it's in the next slide, so it will show you what those look like, and it's a three-year average. So when you're going to implement the project, you take the average of the three years prior to the start of the project, that sets your baseline and it's held static and then in your project you're going to group animals a similar way. So if, let's say your project started in 2007, your baseline would be based on two, the average of 2004, 2005 and 2006. So we bring it down to that functional unit and you will gather the data and calculate for each year that same functional unit um, and adjust for production equivalency in the project and we'll get into that in a little more detail. If you go back to the previous slide, please, Paul. Thank you. The baseline was created by um, the Colorado State University Inventory Group, primarily Dr. Sean Archibek, and the baseline was based on uh, available data sets, and they're listed in Appendix B of the, of the methodology. Um, and it's uh, very good data from Kansas State University, Cattle Facts, which tracks uh, data from feed yards across the U.S. on a, on a monthly and, and annual basis, um, confirmed the data with many professional cattle consultants, and then the ration data was used from the Galleon uh, 2007 and Galleon and Gleghorn 2001 uh, uh, ration uh, data for uh, average rations that are fed to cattle over the time periods from 2000 to almost current. And um, the direction, the conservativeness that we've built into the baseline is that we've used the lowest amount of fat uh, in, or pardon me, the highest amount of fat in rations since 2007 because we know fat suppresses enteric methane. And we've also applied the lowest YM value we can throughout the baseline, so the lowest emission factor. And we've chosen to use the highest gross energy value of the diet, so 19.1 megajoules per kilogram instead of 18.5 and applied that across the whole time. So we're trying to take a very conservative look at what might possibly impact GHGs and ensure that the baseline is conservative based on this industry-wide data. The data goes until, if you could just go to the next slide please, Paul. The data goes to 2011 because that's the availability of the data that we had. We will be updating this methodology and we will rely on Dr. Sean Archibek, who also does the National Emissions Inventory calculations for the US EPA uh, on enteric and, and manure-based cattle emissions. So this will be updated as the methodology evolves. Next slide, please, Paul. Now we're going to talk a little bit about project boundaries. If you can get into the, the next slide, that would be great. So as I mentioned before, the boundary of the protocol um, is the feed yard operation where cattle are raised and fed. So the, the accounting starts when the cattle enter the feed yard and the accounting stops, if you will, when they exit the feed yard. It also encompasses the facility where the manure is stored and handled. Um, it, so manure storage, handling, and application are considered, but there's no ability to alter any management there. It is a fun function of the IPCC calculations as a result of the diets and dry matter intake and ration quality that's going in. The protocol also anticipates that there will be a number of feed yards that will be aggregated under this protocol according to ACR's rules on aggregation. Just a diagram here of the mass and energy flow uh, just to show you that the main uh, emission sources that are 
quantified under this protocol, and you can go through all the onerous tables and calculations and rationale for why we land on these as relevant, according to the ISO 14064 Part 2 process, but these are the, the main uh, sources of nitrous oxide and, and methane that we're quantifying. Next slide, please. A word on the temporal boundaries, if you proceed, please, Paul. So the project start date is defined as the date that the feed yard or group of feed yards in the case of an aggregated project begin to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions against their three-year average performance standard baseline. And that will be determined working cooperatively by the project proponent or developer with the feed yards they have in their project. And it's contemplated that the crediting period for this project can span 10 years from the start date. Next slide, please. And we'll get into a little bit on how the protocol handles additionality. I think you might as well just move through these bullets, Paul, if you will. Thank you. As I mentioned before, it adopts that performance standard approach to additionality. And so the project um, that reduces its carbon intensity, if it gets under that threshold, that performance threshold, then it has a delta and it can move forward. But it's a very conservative baseline. And so as we move forward in our BIGS project, and we intend to work with about two, it's 250,000 head, I could be, no, 500,000 head of beef cattle, we will test out whether uh, there is, you know, a, the ability for feed yards to do better than this performance standard baseline. And in, so in this case, under the rules of ACR, if this goes forward, they d are not required to make a project-specific demonstration for the implementation of barriers. Next slide, please. Now we'll go into a really high-level overview of the quantification. And I think, Paul, you'll just have to work through the bullets. So it does enable the cattle producers to quantify the GHG emissions from the, two, the sources we've talked about. In a very high level, it's at summing up all of the equations, and I'll have a slide on that next, that lead to calculation of those sources, those four sources, but embedded within those four sources are many equations and lots of inputs and, and you know, uh, defaults uh, in IPCC factors that drive them. Um, in this high level, you're subtracting the emissions from baseline to project. Next slide, please. So there's this basic equations that are used. First, the equations that will allow you to calculate for each animal grouping uh, the average enteric methane emissions per grouping, so, you know, this, the heifer categories, the 500 pounds coming in, 600 pounds coming in, 700 up until, you know, the 1,000 the plus pounds that enter the feed yard, um, comparing like to like baseline to project. The manure methane emissions for the project, and those are driven by the volatile solids that are excreted in the manure and all those inputs that we're collecting, the data um, from the feed yard. Then the daily nitrogen excreted with our new improved <laughs> calculation there with our excretion equation. Then you calculate the daily, dry mat daily nitrogen intake and that drives the rest of the equations that calculate the N2 emissions from the various categories outlined in the IPCC equation. Then finally, the final calculations are adjusted for functional equivalence. And essentially, that's production equivalency, so the overall kilograms of carcass weight. You've got your kilograms of CO2e per kilogram of carcass weight for each of those animal categories. You subtract your average from the project. Um, you get the uh, total amount of or the functional unit, and you multiply by the production in the project, the total amount of kilograms of carcass weight to determine your GHG reduction. Next slide, please, Paul. Into the data collection, we'll dive right in. So one thing we've learned about in Alberta through implementing and the pilot studies, which have been going on for about a year, test running this protocol among others, is that there really are two types of data we need to keep in mind that drive any protocol, particularly in agriculture. There's the farm activity data, and these will give you your greenhouse cast performance calculations per kilogram of hot carcass weight by animal grouping. And so we need the feed yard animal inventory. We also need to know how those animals performed in terms of weight gain, how much they ate. Uh, we need the feed and ration data. 
And as I mentioned before, we need the feed jar manure data, but only in the manure management plans and the ability for the project developer to uh, prove to the verifier that the manure management has not changed on that feed yard over the course of the crediting period um, because there is no ability to uh, manipulate manure, different types of manure management in this protocol. The second is the evidence of practice. And so in, the, in this methodology, as you read through it, you will see there is great emphasis on the types of evidence that will go as positive proof towards ensuring that that GHG data in number one is accurate and correct to a reasonable level of assurance. Some of that includes sign-off by a, a professional nutritionist on the rations used. And in Alberta, as we've test run this protocol, a lot of these kinds of data We've seen that feed yards have the capacity, they have the rigor um, and the data controls uh, at a very high level to be able to satisfy reasonable level of assurance. They use a particular uh, economic performance calculation called yardage to determine how, how they are performing as they carry out their business management on the feed yard and that is a very important source of the types of data we need on a weighted average basis because animals are always that, you know, there's an attrition rate, an animal may die, it may get sick, it may be taken out of a particular lot, put back in later, or they may shift animals around. So a weighted average is definitely what we need to run this protocol. And we've tested that through verification on our pilots, and, and, and there will be a greater than 5% variance if we don't use a weighted average. So that's key. Then we need to get the ration data and the use and amount of any feed technologies, if they're using Menensin, uh, how long have they used it, are they using beta agonists, are they using any of those uh, electron receptors, uh, final acceptors, and, and, and genetic selection technologies. Next slide, please. The, the methodology also speaks to what's expected on data procedures. Um, and so documenting those data procedures, and this is for the project developer in particular because that is the control point for, and the capacity for ensuring that the particular feed yard that enters the project has the ability to uh, collect the data to the, to the data needs of the project. And the procedures manual needs to outline a number of things so that the verification can proceed uh, confidently. Next slide, please. Then we're going to address how the, the methodology handles leakage. And so as we assessed the, the types of leakage that can occur in this methodology and work through it, um, there are two things that uh, help uh, mitigate the occurrence of leakage rather than just the, the, the usual here's the project boundary and then there's a number of things out of scope and assessing whether those are primary influences or secondary influences on leakage. In Alberta we follow the ISO 14064 Part 2 process uh, standard and in that process standard it really is taking a streamlined life cycle assessment and considering every source sink a reservoir and whether or not it is controlled related or affected, controlled being under control, of the, uh, of the project proponent, related being is it affected by upstream and downstream activities or is the pro project affecting upstream and downstream activities? And then finally uh, affected, which is are there market factors that are shifting uh, or the project is shifting in terms of, of sources. So once you go through that process and compare them project to baseline, you'll see we've done that throughout. You identify the relevant ones through that thought process and those are the ones that you're going to quantify. In many cases, we bring in the related or secondary scope emissions into the quantification because it will have a significant impact, greater than 5% on the emissions reductions. And then finally, functional equivalence is the other aspect to this, is that we need to have things um, aligned and equivalent between the project and the uh, baseline in terms of the per kilogram of hot carcass weight uh, produced. Next slide, please. So as we assessed the risks, um, we looked at the trends that were happening in the feed, beef feeding industry in the U.S. And, you know, of the different types of leakage, we were confident that activity shifting is probably the one that, that 
you know, we may want to quantify rather than the others. Um, the reason for it is that the majority of beef feed yards really are concentrated in four or five U.S. states, and they've done that because those are the states in which there are similar environmental and economic conditions, and it just makes sense to feed cattle. On the cow-calf side, you will find, you know, obviously ranches all over the country, um, but the feed yards themselves, there's a pretty homologous set of, of states, uh, and they have located there, which means that if you know, if we worried that a feed yard was uh, beginning to operate outside of those, we don't have to worry because it doesn't make sense. And if there was animals shifting out of the project into another feed yard, it would only happen in these states with driven with similar economic and environmental conditions. So the impact would not be that great. Next slide, please. Also, if we look at the trends in the beef cattle sector. Um, and we, the Appendix C in the proto methodology talks about the decrease in beef consumption over time and this um, source here, the USDA and National Agricultural Statistics Survey, we are seeing that there is a, a large contraction happening in the beef industry. So for the time being, um, we're not going to anticipate that if we move forward on a carbon intensity protocol that you know, we're not going to be worrying about uh, the leakage that may occur if we're going to increase the number of heads. There's a 10-year cycle to the beef, beef cattle industry, and it will take them 10 years if, if, let's say, the world demands more beef or the world would like to, uh, or, or if more people want to get into the feeding industry, it'll take at least 10 years for them to build up their herds from the, the levels they are at now. Next slide, please. So when we look at market a leakage, it's really the market effects leakage that we're worried about, not the activity shifting leakage, given that there will be a minor impact if, if animals are shifted in and out of the project in those states that we were discussing. And so here we're applying the same leakage calculation that was developed by ACR in their uh, livestock methodology, the modular one. Um, and so really we lay out the, the the, uh, the parameters around leakage based on that, um, and there is an estimate of the elasticities that can be applied in the equation that is in the leakage section of the methodology. Next slide, please. It is important to point out as well that um, it is possible that the market effects leakage could be positive. It's theoretically possible that there could be positive leakage here. In other words, if the feed yards are, are you know, growing in size and we're doing it on an intensity basis, that because they are so efficient and they've implemented these practices and the whole sector itself is not going to expand, that they could actually be growing animals more efficiently and pulling animals away from other feed yards that are not in the project um, that would result in a, a positive leakage. So we just wanted to point that out. And I think that's, that may be our last slide, Paul, Nick, I think. Yes. Over to you. Great, Karen. Thanks so much. A great presentation. Um, Paul, you can for now leave up that slide so people can uh, have our contact info. Uh, and just before going to questions, I want to remind people, uh, if, if you're interested in asking a question, either either type it into your chat uh, box at the bottom of the panel or uh, click the, the hand button at the top left to, to ask your question directly. Um, I'm going to jump right into some questions that have already been submitted. Um, here's one, uh, Karen, um, you, you spoke about this briefly, but maybe you could say a little bit more. What's the rationale for excluding emissions from from and from the livestock before they enter the feedlots, so the cow calf operations, I guess. Um, well, as I'm, I'm on, yeah, okay, good. Um, they because the boundary here is placed around just the feed yard. So when we're looking at the baseline, we're quantifying just the feed yard, and when we're looking at the project, we're looking at just the feed yard. The reason we went there and we spent a lot of time in Alberta assessing opportunities. Um, and we have other protocols that will allow some of the opportunities to be captured in the cow-calf sector, is that the cow-calf sector is very, very difficult 
to uh, develop a project on. Um, you've got, especially in the U.S., I would think there are a number of ranches and states with varying characteristics of forage quality, environmental parameters, the um, data systems used on cow-calf operations is uh, not uh, consistent, um, and when you have such small uh, ranches, uh, you know, trying to quantify enteric methane emissions based on the IPCC equations that are driven by daily average dry matter intake, we do not have a good process or methodology for capturing A, what is the animals on average uh, ingesting to get an average dry daily matter intake, and B, what is the quality of the feed they are ingesting while they're out on pasture? And so, you know, from the point of view of the quantification methodologies that we're using in this particular protocol, it lends itself much more strongly to uh, applying it to just the feed yard. And that also includes being able to meet reasonable level of assurance with the, the feed yard records and data systems. Great, um, thank you. And this question, I think, is related, but also, um, would the protocol give credit for the sort of potential upstream emission reductions embedded in feed production, whether from fertilizer or, you know, en energy emissions? Um, are those also outside the boundary? Yes, those are outside the boundary as well. And the dairy protocol that hopefully some of you will see and will be coming through the ACR process probably in a couple of months, that's the Alberta one, there is the ability, I suppose, in a course way, we've done the footprint of uh, nitrous oxide and fuel use with Dr. Stephen Ogle at Colorado State University of the feedstuffs coming into the dairy operation. Um, but the only way you could, and they're, I suppose within scope of the dairy protocol, they're not here, is to shift your feedstuffs around, but there is no capture of all the inputs. It's a frozen footprint with a ton of, of feed coming into the dairy operation. So yes, scoping of emissions, uh, anything manipulating the production of the feed is out. Great. And I wanted to highlight, just adding to Karen's answer, that, that uh, she's explained the reasons for the scope and boundaries within this methodology. Uh, that there, is, there is a separate methodology uh, that is currently in review at ACR called Grazing Land and Livestock Management that nicely dovetails with this one in the sense that it does uh, look at some of those opportunities for, uh, you know, changing intensity of grazing management or, or reductions that as well as carbon sequestration that can be achieved in the cow-calf systems. That's separate from today's, however. Um, Nick, could I just jump in for a second? Go ahead, please. Okay, thanks. In Alberta, we have a protocol that is called selecting for low residual feed intake, um, and that one has relevance at the cow-calf sector. It's been in embodied in here, and the scope is, is within the feed yard, but certainly within the the methodology that Nick had mentioned, I think there's room for uh, those cow-calf operators who want to implement the types of genetic traits or, or, or phenotypically identified efficient animals into that methodology. And, and basically, you know, that will take time, but I think the, the prize is large as the herds start to uh, be bred for highly efficient animals and the variability in the efficiency is, is quite large and I think there's significant opportunities there within your pro methodology, Nick. Thank you. Great. Um, here's another question. It seems as if um, this carbon dioxide, both direct and indirect emissions, are excluded from this uh, methodology that just looks at um, methane and nitrous oxide, what's, what are the reasons for that? So in the, in the development of these protocols, uh, the scientists have come to consensus that, um, you know, that, that the scope is going to be the feed yard. It would be cumbersome for the feed yard operator to identify uh, the way crops are grown for, let's say, upstream carbon sequestration emissions, 
would be difficult for them to source all of that data in a reasonable level of assurance around the feedstuffs they bring into their operation. Many of them don't grow. They can't grow. They need external sources. So virtually impossible for them to try to ascertain the, the carbon sequestration impact. Um, so too, downstream, one would say, well, if you're applying manure to soils, you are increasing soil organic carbon sequestration. But when you actually sit down and do the, the, the penciling out, in the baseline, manure goes to soil somewhere. In the project, manure goes to soils somewhere. And you, if that's the case, if you wanted to claim credit for the carbon sequestration, you would have to calculate the amount of carbon that is not being sequestered in the previous application to that that is. And so it, it's kind of a zero-sum game. On the energy emissions of CO2, we've gone through that process in the Streamlined Lifecycle Assessment in the ISO 14064-2. Given today's operations on feed yards, we don't anticipate that there would be much dramatic GHG emissions um, between baseline or changes in those between baseline and project. Um, most feed yards have been using steam flake corn, uh, you know, and will continue to use steam flake corn. Uh, most feed yards source uh, dried distillers grains and solubles during the baseline in the project years in this, so we, we, we could not come up with anything that would have been an alteration, if you will, in the energy emissions between baseline and project. Thank you. Um, here's a changing gears a little bit, one for Garth. Um, could you say a little bit more about the pilot project plans under the Conservation and Innovation Grant? And, and then specifically, um, are, are you guys looking for feed yards who might be interested in participating in the pilot phase implementation? And if so, who should be the contact for that? The plan is to work with uh, 500,000 head. In other words, we would harvest data from a total of 500,000 head of beef cattle that have been through, uh, we may work with as many as 10 feed yards. We have um, a loose agreement with uh, the Texas cattle feeders to identify potential feed yard cooperators, as well as with Innovative Livestock Solutions that operates in primarily Kansas and Nebraska. So we uh, intend to work with feed yards uh, in Texas, Kansas, and Nebraska. We're certainly open to working with uh, feed yards in Oklahoma and Colorado. Um, but that's the uh, that's our intent at this point. Uh, with regard to, I would be the contact person. Uh, you've got my contact information if you're aware of a feed yard that would like to work with us on the pilot. And again, the primary inconvenience to the feed yard cooperators will be simply uh, some face time and uh, to, to understand the project and then to work with the appropriate person in their office to uh, transfer data that will remain confidential. Uh, there will be zero ask regarding changing any sort of uh, routines or, or management practices. Karen, any other thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think that's right. I mean, we've developed, um, based in Alberta, you know, a set of um, data, data fields that is just a matter of being able to pull the data out of the, the performance data, the GHG data calculations, and the uh, ration data um, from the feed yard with minimal disruption. Um, sort of as a follow-on question, uh, does a greenfield operation just now being built qualify under this methodology? And if so, how would that look? What's the process? Hmm. Yes. Yes, I think it sure. would. Sure. I mean, if you look at our, our performance standard baselines, we've got them done up until 2011 based on the latest uh, uh, US EPA report and supporting data that, that Sean, Dr. Archibek has used. Um, it does give some guidance in there that if you are, let's say, let's just starting up and you don't see 
suppose somebody starts in 2013 and there's no 2012 yet, then you would use 9, 10, and 11 as your baseline going forward. It's not your fault that we haven't been able to get it in there. <laughs> so that's the guidance that's offered. Right. As I understand, Karen, you're basically answering that question from the perspective of the baseline is not based on the, the, the recent historic years at the feed yard anyway. So that's not something that would exclude a feed yard from participating since the exactly. baseline is sort of industry-wide. Industry exactly. Right. OK. Um, Here's one. I don't know if you guys have done any estimates, but what's a reasonable expectation of emission reductions per head per year if these practices are implemented? And maybe you'll have to answer that with a little bit more color since the, you know, the, the practices are not prescribed per se, but different practices would be eligible. Have you done those sorts of calculations? Well, I, I can tell you what we've what we've assessed um, in the Alberta protocol that is a, sort of the the basis for this. Um, we are uh, estimating, and given that in Alberta it's a project level baseline, so you need to work with each feed yard, if you will, to develop their own baseline based on their three years average data. But we're seeing about 0.04 to 0.06 tons of reductions per head. And so the yield per animal is small. So the key is to get a large number of animals in the project. Um, the performance standard baseline that we've developed in this methodology, although it greatly helps you know, new entrants get in, you don't have to wait four years. Um, and it greatly uh, streamlines implementation, it is a conservative baseline. So that is one of the things that will be revealed in our pilots uh, that we're going to be running uh, once this, this methodology is approved, hopefully. Garth, would you add anything? No. I, uh, let's see. Yes, you can hear me. Um, that is exactly right. We um, were, were encouraged to, to see that figure, but obviously it's a numbers game. OK. Um, here's a question from a verifier. Um, would this methodology require verification site visits to take place during the reporting period in order to observe the feeding activities, feeding practices? So I guess the clarification is during the reporting period, meaning that's before uh, somebody brings a claim forward uh, and 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 engages the verifier. Is that possible to ask that clarification question of someone, Nick? Well, um, I would think that um, the the reporting period usually means the the period being credited. So okay. you know, in some in some cases, that's going to be you know going forward, and then in some cases, we're talking about a past period here. Um, so so let's 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 answer it that way. Okay. Reporting period meaning the period that you're you're making a greenhouse gas claim and 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 looking to have verified in order to have those credits issued. Okay, thank you. So I think there's two aspects that we've envisioned and contemplated here in this methodology and in Alberta as well. Um, as we understand verification at reasonable level of assurance, um, and we have a a guidance document in Alberta that gives people a lot of uh, guidance on how to do this. Um, third party documentation is sort of a higher tier of evidence quality uh, that would support the project. So there's, there's really two aspects to that. Um, the, as I mentioned before, the feed yards keep very good, good data, very good data management systems. Um, and the, uh, so the records they would compile and the way they manage their data, it would stand up. The verifier would come in. They would be able to oversee all those systems, look at their controls, take a substantive-based approach then and dive in. Um, they should be able to pull up the records uh, where they've got you know, the amounts of feeding additives or the rations. They're all there. Um, and the second aspect is that we require a professional nutritionist, a third-party professional, to sign off on the ration sheets and the project proponent will have those on file as well as the feed yard 
and that is just the higher level of due diligence by the professional nutritionist that said these are the rations that were fed for this group of animals for that time period, um, and that you know the additives will be part of that. Uh, so you know when the verifier comes in and in under ACR's rules for aggregation and verification, there will be a sampling done based on an, a, a number of, of characteristics of the data. There will be those two aspects. The verifier will be able to see at the project developer's office, and then in the sample of feed yards they visit, they will look for those same things, alignment. Um, and so, yes, I guess I've answered your question in a very long and winded way, but it won't happen on every feed yard. And Nick, I, I may be st saying tale and tales out of school. I'd like you to add into that, if you will. No, no, I think that's uh, the, the person who asked uh, typed in the clarification. They meant the time period that project activities take place. So okay. essentially the same as the way you were answering it, you know, the, okay, the reporting credit, crediting period or the, well, the, the period of credit issuance as well as the period of project activities. So, okay. uh, you know, I think the, the answer, uh, you know, confirm that you could confirm is, is um, that in some cases we'll be talking about, you know, uh, years that have already, where these practices have, have already been implemented and uh, there would be a sampling of, um, of the feed yards that the verifier would, would visit and look at their data management systems and so on. They wouldn't necessarily be observing during the reporting period, but they would be sampling the feed yards and sampling the data management systems with additional levels of sign-off by the professional animal science. That's right, and there is, they will be able to go on and see, just as we did as we visited, uh, you know, Texas cattle feeders and livestock solutions feed yards, they'll be able to see where they blend their feed, see where they're perhaps adding, you know, some of the things that are improving the performance of the cattle. So, I mean, they're going to be continuing to do those things. As, and so verifiers will be able to go out and look at those in real time, maybe not, you know, a little bit of the past stuff, but they'll get a sense of what they're doing and continue to do. Great, thank you. Um, what is the approximate percentage of baseline emissions from enteric methane versus nitrous oxide emitted from excreted manure? Do you know the answer to that question? Can you repeat the question? Yes. The, so the, the person is wondering uh, what's the approximate per percentage of baseline emissions from enteric methane versus nitrous oxide in the excreted manure? You know, I don't have those off the top of my head. <laughs> I don't either. Certainly it's minor. Uh, yeah. the, the nitrous, uh, but whether that's uh, 10 or 18 percent, I don't, I'm sorry that we don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to dive into some of our actual data we've gathered from, you know, some of the pilot studies to get those numbers. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I agree with Garth. Uh, when you take a look at the enteric emissions versus the manure emissions, particularly in beef cattle, where the manure is handled and stored and applied dry. If you go back to the slide that Nick had when he was presenting, you know, the breakdown in U.S. livestock emissions, take a look at dairy emissions from manure where it's or hogs where a lot of it is liquid, you're looking at significantly higher emissions um, from the liquid side than you are from the solid side. So. Uh, that, that's one thing to consider. Uh, I guess the other thing to consider is, um, it, you know, depending on how the manure is handled when it's dry, it can have higher nitrous oxide emissions than liquid manure stored in a lagoon, but maybe not so much when it's applied to soil. So there's a number of dynamic factors here. Liquid manure is applied to soil, the conditions for nitrous oxide formation of, you know, having high carbon, dissolved organic carbon moisture, uh, you know, getting those little bugs stimulated. There's offsetting effects that uh, need to be considered as well. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, new question. The biochar literature has recently indicated that a small addition of char to feed is helpful in reducing enteric emissions. Could that fit into this methodology? I guess, would that be an eligible practice here? 
the way the protocol is written, we have suggested examples of strategies that we know are on the cusp and innovative, but the other category is wide open. Um, and so my, my encouragement would be if this methodology does get approved and, you know, the research demonstrates that, um, you know, that, that biochar addition on the front end, just hold that thought, because um, on the back end, in terms of N2 emissions from soils, biochar helps too, but on the front end, um, you need to justify how they may impact uh, decreased carbon intensity. So approaching ACR and saying, you know, we think this is one of those strategies that, that counts based on this research, I don't see why not. And then on the back end, there have been studies, about five, six, seven of them on chicken manure and others, uh, beef cattle manure, that show that biochar blending um, with the product applied, particularly on the solid, solid manure side, actually can reduce N2 emissions from, um, you know, application. However, that would not, and very astutely asked question, that would not count under this protocol, but it's certainly on the input side, it would. Uh, th thanks, Karen. L let me say just a little bit more about that. Um, f first of all, um, if the person's interested in looking further, in section 2.1 of the methodology, uh, you'll see a list of, of examples of eligible practices. But that says include but not limited to. And the last category is other innovative techniques. So the, the short answer to this question is that the methodology is really not prescribing or excluding any particular practice. It's giving some examples of things that have been tried, um, but really any practice that is implemented within the feed yard and would reduce carbon intensity as compared to the performance standard baseline uh, sh should be eligible. And so, so within the scope of what Karen was addressing, you know, within the boundaries of the feed yard, uh, there's nothing in the methodology that would exclude that. Um, I Particu also wanted to... Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. Particularly, the person who's, who asked that question is very astute because, you know, we're not looking at how it may impact manure management by adding biochar at the back end. They're asking whether it would count as if it's added to feed as a feeding strategy. So, yes. Right. Right. And that was my other point I wanted to mention, too, that, that there is a, um, a, uh, a forthcoming biochar methodology that, that looks at biochar applied. As a, as a soil amendment from various feedstocks, so that there will be uh, um, shortly an ACR methodology coming out for comment around that specifically. But but that would not that would be separate from the possible use of biochar as, as a feed uh, feed additive here. Um, new question: um, If this methodology results in allowing more cattle into the feed yard, which the person is calling positive additionality. Um, would that not reduce additionality? How would total cattle in the U.S. or the world be accounted for? So I'm not I'm not familiar with the positive additionality, uh, you know, label, but but I think that the question is, what if the cow, no, more cattle come into the feed yard? You know, how, how would this methodology handle those uh, reductions, which are you know everything is in terms of intensity reductions here? It's, it sounds like maybe the question refers to positive leakage, meaning that uh, the cattle, because they're, the cattle would experience perhaps as much as six or seven days uh, less on feed because of uh, technology advancements, then the, to keep the feed yard full, cattle would be pulled away from less efficient feed yards into this feed yard, so therefore the total greenhouse gas emissions, assuming a constant cow herd inventory, would be less because the uh, beef, in, or excuse me, the uh, carbon intensity per pound of beef would be overall less as a result of the uh, more cattle coming to that feed yard. Am I tracking correctly on, on that, Karen? Yeah, I, I think the question is around leakage. Um, and, you know, the activity shifting we're not concerned about, 
because feed yard animals are located in very homogeneous uh, U.S. states with similar environmental and economic conditions, so then that's market effects leakage. And so if this, you know, with the calculation in section 5.5.1, if that very efficient feed yards that are in this project are, as Garth said, pulling away cattle from less efficient feed yards, then overall there will be a reduction across the herd that are in feed yards in the U.S. And so the scope of this is U.S. Does that make sense? I, I think that does make sense, Karen. So, so okay. on, the, on the topic of market effects leakage, potential positive leakage if, if um, increased production from, you know, efficient feed yards that are lower emission than the, than the st performance standard, if that causes fewer cattle to be produced or, or less, less uh, output of beef to be produced elsewhere in, in more greenhouse gas intensive feed yards, that th there would be in effect a positive leakage. And, and the questioner can look at the, it's in 5.5.2, I think, of the methodology for, for how that, that's handled. Um, Um, okay, just a clarification on, a, on an earlier question. Uh, you mentioned, Karen, uh, in Alberta, 0.04 to 0.06 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per head. Um, was it, um, sorry, first of all, was it 0.4 to 0.6 or 0.04 to 0.06? And secondly, yep. go ahead. No, go ahead. And the second question was that, was that related to enteric emission reductions? and manure emission reductions or just enteric? That's um, both. So that's the way the, the, the uh, protocol calculates uh, the emission reductions using both the enteric and the methane. Um, given that some of these animals only, you know, exist in the feed yard for sometimes, you know, 70 days if they're brought in heavier. Um, if they're lighter animals and younger animals, they're longer. Um, so, you know, on average, that, that's the reduction per head, but there's, you know, 94 million head of cattle in the U.S. Not all of those are in feed yards, but a significant chunk of them are in feed yards. So, yes, the emissions are small per head, but if it was implemented across a large number of animals, a significant reduction could be, could be seen um, and make it worthwhile. Uh, you know, if, if we look at the uh, the emission reductions from enteric methane in the U.S., taking your numbers from the latest inventory, there was 137.4 megatons from enteric fermentation and uh, 70 megatons from a year, 200 megatons altogether. With this protocol and others that will be coming forward, even drop that by 10 percent, that's 20 million tons per year. That's a significant amount. Um, and that's half of all Canada's agricultural emissions taken together. So, you know, the view for this protocol is uh, have it easily adaptable, have the, we don't, we, there's the capacity within the feeding sector to do this protocol. If we can get it adopted across a yard number, a large number of feed yards in the U.S., there will be significant impact. And, and in case uh, some of the listeners haven't done the math yet, uh, you know, a 10,000 head feed yard would be a small feed yard, but that would generate uh, 400 tons based upon uh, a harvest of, uh, of the actual cattle. And of course, there'd be in many feed yards uh, a couple turns a year. 100,000 head of cattle would be 4,000 tons of uh, carbon created or reductions. Great. Thanks, Garth. Um, so we're just about at the end of the questions and at the end of our time. I have one more to ask, but um, I want to ask everyone, if, if, if there are any further questions, please go ahead and type them in uh, while we're doing this one, and then um, so we make sure we get those answered. Um, the question uh, I have here uh, is, if, I'm not sure if Garth or Karen, you could speak to this, but what's the potential relevance of this protocol to the California cap and trade market. Is it something that is something that um, you see potential for uh, the Air Resources Board to uh, 
to look at as a, as a compliance officer protocol? Well, yes, um, most definitely. It's we're we're very that that is the prize. That is the uh, ultimate goal. Here would be to create compliance grade carbon for the uh, capped sector in California to use for their uh, reduction uh, requirements. And so we are in discussions with uh, ARB as well as, of course, ACR. And so uh, it's a, it, it, you know, it, it will take a long time. And the reception that uh, ARB has given to agricultural offset protocols is, uh, is not quite what you call all embracing. But it is uh, the, the understanding, the education, the communications uh, continue on a week-to-week -week basis. And of course, one of the protocols that is compliance grade is the um, destruction of, uh, of um, methane from, uh, from liquid manure at uh, hog and cattle and, and uh, dairy operations, or excuse me, hog and cattle or dairy cattle operations. Um, and uh, Garth, the other part of that question was, are, are there feed yards in California where this could be used? For sure. OK. Um, well, that brings us to the end of our questions, unless the, the presenters have any, anything to add. Um, any last thoughts? We'll, we'll wrap up here. Great. Appreciate well, everyone's um, att attendance, and thanks for your um, MC and Nick. Thank yes, you. absolutely. Thanks, so, so thanks to the presenters. And I just wanted to reiterate at the very end here that um, this methodology is open for public comment. Um, we, we welcome your comments. Please go to AmericanCarbonRegistry.org and click on the Standards and Verification tab. You'll, get, you'll find this methodology in the, in the list under public comment. Send us your comments by September 20th. And every every comment that gets sent in will get a response, and you know, where possible, will we'll be worked into the methodology before it goes to the next stage. So thank you very much, everyone, for your for your attendance and for your great questions. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.